Hello, everyone. My name is um, Kweku Kranten. I'm a professional uh, officer um, um, at ICLE Africa. Um, it's my pleasure to be your moderator for today's session. Um, I'm moderating today's webinar titled um, Enacting Energy Access in Africa's Urban Informal Settlement Under the Changing um, Cities um, webinar hosted by ICLE Africa. Um, the webinar is part of enact, uh, enacting or enabling Africa cities for transformative action, <clears throat> transformative energy access um, project. Um, enact or uh, enabling the enabling African cities for transformative energy access project is funded by the foreign um, foreign foreign Commonwealth um, and Development Office of the UK government and as part of the Transforming Energy Access um, program. The INAC project is a three-year program um, that is actually a three-year program that is, is, is supported by um, a number of partners. Um, we have um, we have um, 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 FCDO, FCDO being the managing partner, um, INAC being the delivery partner, and supported by Energy for um, Impact, um, with city partners in Uganda and Kampala. Um, the focus of the project is to actually enable um, energy access within informal settlements in, in Africa. Um, the objective is to improve energy security in Africa with a focus on um, informal settlements in these two particular countries. Um, before I actually proceed, um, I would want us to actually um, um, take a moment um, to, to, I would like us to take a moment to actually recognize and send our sympathies to, to, to um, um, residents of, of Susan's Bay who have actually been exposed to a major tragic fire incident in Freetown, um, which has affected almost about 70,000 people, um, almost about 1,579 households, um, and almost over 400 people injured in that particular incident. Um, so uh, on behalf of ICLE, we send our very deep um, heartfelt um, um, sympathy to those individuals and households that have been affected. And we want to assure our city partners that we are with them in this particular tragic moment. And before I actually proceed um, with the tax of the day and the responsibility that is actually accorded me, I would wish we can actually just um, recognize some few house rules um, in terms of how the webinar is going to be structured and how activities are actually going to pan out. Um, the webinar is recorded, so as you participate and join the session, um, you naturally consent to um, being recorded. Um, when you enter the discussion, when we enter the discussion period, um, please feel free to actually post your questions and comments in the chat box. Um, when we have time, we would actually call individuals or call, question, call individuals to actually pose their questions directly. In that process, kindly turn on your camera and your audio, then you can actually um, uh, uh, post or, 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 or ask your questions. However, in the meantime, please, as you join, turn off your cameras, um, turn off your audio and just listen in. If you have any questions or discussions, kindly post it in the Q&A chat sessions. But before we actually proceed, um, I would again would want to also remind you this since this is the decade of action for Africa, um, Rise Africa Action Festival 2021 is actually encouraging participants to actually join and submit proposals for various sessions um, covering um, art, creative expressions, and papers um, for this particular festival. 
So we encourage everyone, urban scholars, practitioners to actually um, note this particular date and send through their participation ahead of time. Um, before I actually proceed, I would, I would, I would invite the head of my department to actually speak and welcome everybody here to today's webinar. Um, before I take the excitement out of, of the entire, uh, entire presentations, the amazing presentations that we have for today's sessions. So I'm inviting Dr. Megan Spears. Um, she'll be joining us um, with today's session, giving us an overview of various activities or energy related projects that ICLE has been contributing to um, in the past years. Thank you, Kweku. It's uh, very good to join you all in today's webinar. As said, this is part of ICLE Africa's Changing Cities webinar series, and we host these regularly and will do throughout 2021. And the focus is really for us and partners to walk the road, in particular with African cities, as they tackle issues of sustainability in their spaces. And today's focus on energy access, which is what we'll be speaking about for the next hour or two, is such a, a pertinent issue, uh, in particular for our continent of Africa. And the discussions today will not only focus on energy access, but specifically energy access in the informal settlements of Africa. And we know that something around 53 million people live in informal settlements in Africa struggle to gain access to energy and this has severe ramifications for their quality of life and the ability uh, for equality and inequality to be dealt with so it's such a pertinent topic and i think it's also struck home in particular as important as we saw that photograph that Kweku shared in terms of the fire that broke out in freetown recently and as said we do send our condolences to to all involved we know the challenge related to energy access on the continent is significant. Around 600 million people on the African continent do not have access to electricity. And as said, this has severe implications for their vulnerability and their ability to live um, good quality lives and be resilient to issues such as climate change. We also know in terms of where we're going into the future that there seems to be a concentration of this issue of energy access and scholars are saying that by 2040, 90% of those without access to electricity and almost 50% of those without access to clean cooking are going to be located on our content, con continent of Africa. And so tackling this challenge is pertinent, it's urgent, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from the experts on our panel in terms of how this can be dealt with particularly in terms of uh, energy access and informal settlements today. This is of course overlaid with the fact that we know the African population is growing significantly. Also by 2040, we know that one in two people that are born are going to likely be African. So the world is increasingly African and we need to ensure that the world that these individuals are being born into is one in which they can thrive and lead good lives. We really do have two options and how we deal with the energy access shortages on our continents and this growing population. One is to ensure this access through fossil fuel backed energy and the other is to look at renewable energy options and a, or a combination of the two. But what we, we cannot uh, avoid is the need to tackle energy access from the perspective of making sure that those that are most vulnerable to socioeconomic challenges, to COVID-19 pandemics and the like, to climate change are prioritized. And we believe, and we hope our partners on this webinar believe that renewable energy and clean cooking technologies and solutions offer us a real opportunity to provide energy to vast swathes of, our, of the African population and to do so in a way that tackles inequality and social inclusion, which are the serious ills uh, of our time. I, I, before I hand back over to Quick, who want to say, a very special thank you to the funders of the ENACT project that we at Clear Africa are implementing with the project managers, Carbon Trust, who are here with us today, with our, our partners, Energy for Impact, that are also represented on the panel and funded by FCDO, who has put countless uh, pounds 
towards trying to tackle this issue of energy access and particularly energy access on the African continent. We, we take this program and this project very seriously. We're very grateful to the wonderful collaboration we've had to date with our partners in Kampala and in Freetown. And our, as I said, I really look forward to the discussions that we will now have facilitated by Kweku. And please do take the opportunity as, as attendees of this webinar to reach to us via the chat function. Kweku will do his best to facilitate some discussion towards the end of this webinar, but we will take the conversations forward bilaterally with, uh, with individuals. So please engage, please interact, and please feel very welcome. Thank you. Over to Kweku. Thank you, Megan, um, for the very insightful um, um, overview and, and presentation of our energy assets and, and um, recalling our partners um, and the contributions our partners have actually made in enabling and making this particular even webinar possible. Um, again, as I indicated um, from the initial uh, presentation, um, we have expertise and we've been working and partnering with a number of, of, of cities and, and, and we wouldn't want to actually take the excitement from, from them and messages from them. We want to actually allow them to present their own story. Um, so we want the cities to set the scene for today's presentation um, by enabling them to actually speak on their issues and, and be able to give us an overview of what actually pertains within their own context. Um, for that reason, we would again give the honor to um, Freetown. Um, we are inviting Evans Ben Johnson from Freetown to actually um, start the presentation um, um, for us, set the scene and give us an overview of how energy access looks like in Freetown and what we should expect. Mr. Ben Johnson, please over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to um, join all of us um, this morning to discuss an important um, topic affecting um, majority of our residents in um, Africa, especially looking at um, energy access. As we all are aware and know that energy affordable energy access is one of the key pillars of the um, sustainable development goals. And in Freetown, we have a population of 1.2 million and most of our residents um, live in, um, in um, the capital, it's a slum and informal settlements. And so, um, Energy access is one of the challenging issues we have here in Freetown, not only for the um, poor, but also for the rich. And so I want to predicate um, my um, presentation this morning on just a few points. One that is looking at um, the energy situation we have in Freetown, looking at what the Freetown City Council through the Transform Freetown agenda um, plans for energy and how to fill the gaps, how, um, how um, the private sector could come in and partner with governments and local councils to improve energy access, especially in informal settlements in Freetown. And that could be applicable to other cities as well. So first of all, I would want to start by looking at, briefly looking at what are the energy goals we look at energy goals at the national level. So of course, I've talked about the universal access to energy, and we also like to look at the financial sustainability of this access and reforms in the energy sector and the significant increase in renewable energy. One strategy, of course, the, the government, the, the government's national agenda for energy is predicated on these four, on these four strategic pillars. But also, we are looking at the Transform Freetown and how this aligns to the energy, um, affordable energy, especially for our residents, 35% of whom live in informal settlements around Freetown.
Um, so like I said, let me just go and look at um, the, the population and energy, because that will give us a sense of how we are energy insufficient. So for the whole of the country, we have a population of 7 million. And a third of that live in the capital Freetown with a small land space compared to the whole country. Urban households in the capital city is about 583,000 compared to the rural households of about 600,000. And generally the, the capacity of electricity generation nationally is mostly not from renewable sources. So we have the hydro, which is um, producing electricity mostly during the rainy seasons and in the dry seasons like now, we depend on generation from thermal electricity, uh, from thermal electricity which produces about 63%, about 152 megawatts of the current electricity. But one thing that is um, purely on the low at this moment is looking at alternative renewable energy sources, which put together is about 30 megawatts, which is 12%. But we haven't seen the private sector coming into the energy field. It is small scale at the moment, about 4%. That's 10.4 megawatts being generated. And so, we focus on Freetown. Freetown, like I said, has a density of about 8,450 persons per kilometer. Freetown is one of the most crowded cities in Africa compared to 16,900 um, persons per kilometer in Kinshasa and other places. And the city alone accounts for about 30% of the country's GDP, despite housing about 15% of the population and occupying less than 0.5 of the land mass. So we can see this, Freetown has 72 informal settlements scattered along the coastal hillsides. And so on her, on the, on, on her ascension as mayor, when she was elected in 2018, Ivan Akisoya and the Freetown City Council developed a transform Freetown agenda. And by this agenda, there are certain um, sectors that um, we have looked at broadly. So one of the major sectors which I will dive, digress on is the environmental management sector. And the relevance of this sector to access to energy is one, reduction of emissions due to decreased use of biomass. We should note that most of our informal settlements in Africa rely hugely on the use of biomass as fuel, mostly for cooking, that is wood and charcoal. And this has the resultant effect of causing lots of deforestation. As we speak, we are losing up to 500,000 trees every year due to deforestation. And mostly it's um, wood and charcoal for energy also building and construction and agriculture. And another sector of the Transform Freetown Plan is health. As you can, as you will note, there is um, a lot of pollution. And so the related activity to energy for health is the less reduction of smoke and improve air quality that will better equip health and to better equip health facilities. So we are looking at all these sectors. There is education, skills development, water, job creation, and financial benefit, urban mobility. But all at this, we are looking at how to use clean transport um, as we are piloting a cable car. How to make sure houses are built in, in a sustainable manner. All these are the core benefits of the Transform Freetown agenda to improve energy access. But also, how does the private sector come in because looking at our, our landscape, we know energy access is a problem for informal settlements. If you look at um, electricity generation and use in, urban, um, in informal settlements, and also the use of um, clean cooking, 
our 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 people in the um, informal settlements are really really deprived. For instance, Craig mentioned about um, Susan's Bay, which is one of one of the big informal settlements in the community. That community lives in a gregarious and tightly closed interlocked um, environment. And in the past, most of um, these connections have led to electrical malfunction, which causes um, outbreaks of fires. So we are looking at how to encourage the private sector to come in and improve energy access. So under the Transform Free Town Plan, we are looking at how to encourage two business models. And we think under this model, two things can be done to improve energy access. One, we look at um, electricity and usage. So we think through solar PV installations and supply, the private sector can provide energy lighting for people in urban settlements, in informal settlements. And secondly, is the use of clean cooking gas, especially through um, the biogas production, either at home or for community. So these are models that we think can work. And one model is to use the public-private public, public partnership, encouraging, creating the enabling environment through a legislative and, and legislative framework for people to come into the sector. So for instance, one of the major challenges is clean cooking. The use of LPG gases, mostly imported, is limited in terms of affordability and access in informal settlement. But we have seen that the use of biogas converting waste into energy, especially from clean cooking, is one way the private sector can come and invest and partner with government and local councils to make sure people have clean cooking. We've seen that model being applied very well in Kenya, in Rwanda, and other countries. And people are getting clean um, energy to cook. And this we know have the chain effect of having improved well beings especially for women and children who suffer mostly from indoor household air pollution as a result of using wood and charcoal for cooking. And we also want a full private sector um, investment in terms of equity and take on debt to cover both development and implementation costs for renewable energy and IPP ventures. Now, what will this project, the ENAC project benefit to Freetown? Like I've said, the greenhouse gas inventory that we developed in 2018 noted that there is 35% of stationary energy. Transport, there is 33% and water 30%. So when we look at all this, we see that Freetown is highly, highly polluted. And if we are to make our informal settlements have access to energy, we need to create that access through agreement with key lined ministries. Example, the Ministry of Energy, the Ministry of Environment. This is very key. And this will benefit our people in terms of reducing pollution levels, but also improving health and well-being. We also want, through this energy um, access, to increase awareness through community engagement as we've been doing. So one model FCC is using is engaging communities, first in bad practices that harms the environment and in sensitizing people of using alternative energy that are sustainable for well-being and the environment. We've also tried to improve the capacity of FCC staff on access to energy needs, because the better our staff are informed, the better the message will go out. And we also look at reducing energy poverty. So this is a new phenomenon in Sierra Leone, and this is what Transform Freetown is trying to push, energy poverty. Most people talk about um, poverty in the sense of having livelihoods and economic um, benefits to live. But we also know that people are energy poor, and this poor energy 
this energy uh, poverty is something that we really, really want to emphasize so that people get the awareness. But also, we want to save the environment. We want to save the environment. And by this, why does this matter for Freetown? People want to ask. We'll look at how energy access can improve and benefit Freetown. Like I've stated, reduction pollution, especially indoor household air pollution is one major concern. Most people reporting for um, health statistics, most people see that there is an increase in access um, in, in cardiovascular diseases. So there is a health benefit associated to clean energy. And we also want to sustain a climate action plan for the city. So energy access is part of the climate action plan we are developing for Freetown. And by that, we will leverage the energy poverty that I'm talking about. So there are enablers also we want to look at. That is to unbundle public energy entities, increase the presence of public, private, and um, public sector entities and international partners, and get a national commitment to increase energy access to renewable energy potentials. We know that Sierra Leone and Freetown has um, renewable energy potentials, and we want to scale that. And the ability for the city to control budget, especially through the through encouragement of private players to come into the space. And now we want to look at um, the legislative and um, environment. So as a council, we do not regulate energy as, as, it, as it should be. Because the 2004 Local Government Act under which we operate has not devolved the function of energy access to the council. But, and so FCC does not have um, energy access project we are implementing. But through the Transform Freetown agenda, we are seeking to broaden energy access as part of our environmental management plans. And with this, and uh, the work we've already been doing in planting trees to save the environment and looking at promoting the use of alternative energy, especially biogas for our um, informal settlement and powering and you know, promoting solar energy in our, um, in our informal settlement is the way we think we can regulate and promote energy access in our informal settlements. I think, um, for FCC and for Transform Full Town, that is our energy situation. I'll pause here to um, listen to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, LBJ. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I mean, thank you for making time on such uh, uh, a busy schedule um, with the situation in Freetown to actually join this particular webinar. We know how, how difficult it must be for um, FCC um, um, at the moment to actually make time to actually uh, be part of this particular um, webinar. And we are very grateful for your input and giving us an overview of, of the situation in Twitter. Um, and I guess you set the conversation rolling, but um, this is just a quick reminder um, to the next few speakers, kindly stick to your time because uh, we just want to give everyone a, a an opportune time to be able to present um, their, um, their slides as much as possible. So you don't have to be in a hurry, but try and keep it to the point so that again, we can enable everyone to actually present um, as, 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 as required. However, um, we'll, since we started from Freetown in West Africa, um, Sierra Leone, we are now going down to Uganda um, and we are, um, our next speaker is from the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development in Uganda, Martin, Martin Bingwa. Um, please uh, take over and, and, and give us an overview of the situation in Uganda. Uh, thanks, um, uh, uh, Mr. Kweku. Uh, uh, a greeting to you all. Uh, my name is Martin Mutabingwa. I'm an energy officer with uh, the Ministry of Energy. Uh, in Uganda. Uh, and my presentation is just going to be uh, an outlook uh, perspective on uh, the, 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 the energy sector of Uganda, uh, which I'll 
I'll take you through a bit of the supply, demand and access structures. Uh, maybe just a brief uh, data on uh, the informal settlements uh, in uh, Uganda in general, and maybe Kampala in particular, uh, the energy challenges that we're facing, uh, the gender balance uh, consideration that uh, the Ministry of Energy is, is putting uh, in place, and maybe some outlook on uh, scaling uh, of clean energy and uh, affordable energy solutions. So the Ministry of Energy, uh, uh, in short, MEMD, uh, the man our mandate is to develop, manage, and uh, uh, is, is to develop and manage and maintain the, the energy infrastructure projects in the country. Uh, we advise uh, government on matters concerning uh, energy and uh, mineral development in uh, projects generally. We collaborate with international and uh, intergovernmental and other state agencies on matters relating to development and maintenance of energy projects and to contribute uh, to uh, addressing uh, the energy concerns uh, through coordination with relevant energy uh, agencies of the government. Uh, so in 1999, uh, the Electricity Act uh, unbundled the, the, the government the, the Uganda Electricity uh, Board, which was main, which was in charge of generation, transmission, and uh, distribution of power, and uh, the new structure ever since uh, uh, 1999 has uh, government, particularly as a bulk uh, purchaser and supplier of power, that is the UETCL, uh, the transmission company. Uh, government has some interventions in uh, generation as well as uh, uh, distribution, but has largely uh, invited uh, the private sector to uh, to invest, and so we have uh, many uh, independent power producers, as well as uh, uh, private companies uh, running uh, the distribution service territories uh, within the, the the country. We have some uh, off grid uh, structures. Uh, for example, in the West Nile region of Uganda, where we have some small distribution companies that directly supply, uh, directly get generate and supply to customers. But uh, oh, oh, the generation and distribution uh, criteria and licenses are all uh, managed by the Electricity Regulatory Authority, which is under the Ministry of Energy. So that's the general structure of uh, the energy sector in Uganda. I can move to the next, please. So Uganda has a total installed generation capacity of uh, 1,252.3 megawatts, uh, and we're expecting uh, more by the end of uh, next year. Uh, the peak demands uh, for Uganda uh, fell uh, during uh, the, the, the first impact of, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But as of February 2020, we had reached about 728.7 uh, megawatts. Uh, on a national level, 50% of households have access to a source of electricity, uh, be it uh, on the national grid or by uh, solar lighting uh, or owning uh, some form of solar system. This, this normally involves, uh, on a smaller scale, maybe uh, just uh, lighting and maybe a charging system, and in some instances, uh, a bit more than that. But that's, uh, that's how... That, that's how the, the statistics are spread out. We have about 30, 33% of our rural households using off-grid solutions as their primary source of electricity. Uh, this is majority for uh, solar lighting systems. Uh, as per our 2018 uh, electricity for road transformation uh, census, we, we assessed that about 74% of households spend less than 5% of their income on our fuel for cooking. Uh, we realize that the energy, the main energy consumption is normally around cooking and about 74% uh, was using less than 5%. This is because of uh, charcoal and firewood being primary sources for cooking as opposed to uh, electricity and uh, LPG. Uh, where settlements uh, try to improve their, their uh, cooking stoves, the, we realized that about 47% uh, 
were spending just over five percent of their of, of their of their household income, and so uh, that that shows you that there's a certain uh, price challenge that we have when it comes to clean sources of en uh, using energy. Uh, as far as the challenges that we we can assess uh, in across the country and even in uh, Kampala, the scope of this uh, project. Uh, clean sources of energy have an issue about, uh, have, have a challenge of cost. And uh, one of the potential solutions that we have tried to implement is uh, some re reduction of taxes or tax exemption, for example, uh, tax exemption on solar products to make them more affordable and therefore uh, more accessible. Uh, we, as, as a growing country, we, of of uh, electricity connection uh, fee, and this uh, led the, the government to uh, implementing the electricity connections policy, which uh, to fund the connection fee and the, con the connection fee all and one pole uh, connections. Uh, then uh, for the issue for the challenge of uh, high cost of house wiring. Uh, the, the Rural Electrification Agency and the Ministry of Energy work together to create uh, uh, ready boards, distribution of ready boards uh, at a subsidized price. And this would enable some people to uh, have cheap uh, early access to energy and maybe just uh, through cultural uh, change, uh, encourage them to use more electricity. I've got the next slide, please. So uh, on the issue of gender, uh, there, uh, the, the ministry uh, recently placed uh, a, a gender committee to ensure gender mainstreaming uh, on, on, uh, on policy and plans and, and, and budget uh, level. We have worked with the Ministry of Gender and Labor and Social Development in uh, incorporating social risk mitigations and safeguards uh, to enhance uh, components in the energy infrastructure development projects. We hired a, a, a consultant to, enable, to, to help us create an agenda strategy for supporting the, mini, the, the ministry's uh, efforts. Uh, go to the next one, please. Yeah, so additionally, uh, we promoting uh, gender equality in, in access to clean energy solutions. We're trying to undertake some uh, inclusive uh, socioeconomic development uh, undertakings through supporting uh, gender equality on both the supply and demand sides of clean energy. Uh, we are supporting uh, women as uh, beneficiaries of clean energy technologies, including productive uses, as well as women as energy service providers uh, and uh, improved access. One of the things that uh, this uh, this consultant that the ministry has hired is doing is to enable us to get more uh, disaggregated metadata on uh, on on on, on uh, what the actual scope of undertakings needs to be, uh, and this is enabling us to even promote more uh, gender uh, mainstreaming uh, in our uh, efforts. Uh, some of the some of the outlooks for uh, scaling up. Uh, access to clean energy and affordable energy solutions uh, involve uh, promoting energy stoves through subsidies. Uh, we're training communities in collaboration with the NGOs and district uh, local governments, and uh, also trying to develop standards for energy technologies uh, and, and promotion of solar, wind, and biogas uh, and efficient uh, charcoal production. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um... Martin, um, for the very brief um, overview of the energy situation in Uganda, uh, particularly looking at um, um, giving a whole overview of, of the country and the various energy um, dimensions and domains, specifically also looking at our interest area that is with um, 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 four urban households. Um, we, were, we are supposed to be joined by um, an officer from um, KCCA, but unfortunately, um, he's having some connectivity issues. 
So I would call on the next speaker, uh, Messi Rose um, from Energy for Impact um, to step in as we try and connect with Uganda. Um, I mean, as you are all aware, um, connectivities and technologies can sometimes fail us. So at this moment, we trust and hope that he is able to actually connect with us and take over and present his, his side um, uh, the, the situation from the city of uh, um, um, Kampala. So Mercy, um, please, you can actually um, begin your presentation and yeah, take it from here. Okay, thank you very much, Kwaku. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join this webinar. Um, perhaps we can just get started. Yeah, so I will be going over four key issues as pertains to urban energy access in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'll look at the, uh, some of the key challenges in access of uh, the barriers to a delivery of um, energy and as well as access, um, how to go about addressing these, uh, these challenges and some of the underlying factors involved in designing an intervention. Um, so to start with, the UN Habitat estimates that about 59% of urban dwellers in Africa live in informal settlements. So if the, the urban population is projected to triple to 1.5 billion people between 2015 and 2050, and if nothing is really, and if everything um, remains constant, then the number of urban dwellers living in informal settlements are likely to increase by a similar rate. Um, the problem with urbanization in Africa is it does not bring the same level of, of economic growth as experienced in other regions across the world. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular uh, is urbanizing at a much lower GDP per capita uh, level uh, compared to other regions. And as a result, the share of the urban poor continues to grow owing to the rising inequalities in, in income and uh, economic op opportunity in urban areas. Access to quality, reliable and affordable energy would play a pivotal role in facilitating improved livelihoods through income generation, improved household health, improved social services and savings for the end users. So if nothing is done now to improve energy access, we risk missing the SDG seven um, to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy by 2030 by at least 100 million people. Next, please. Um, so before we can address this energy access challenge, we need to understand the underlying barriers, both to improving energy services and infrastructure in informal settlements and to accessing them. Um, in the, on the supply side, I would say the, the three most common barriers um, on, based on our research are cost, policy, and information. So energy providers, both private and, and public, perceive urban informal settlements as a high risk market. Um, some issues related to cost include things such as um, cost to upgrading or extending the, the existing main grid, um, the haphazard and dense nature of the layouts of the houses, which makes it difficult to expand, uh, difficult and expensive to expand um, or set up a main grid um, network or access roads, a lack of proper distribution channels for off-grid energy and co clean cooking products, uh, which forces companies to set them up themselves often at a great cost. In addition, there is very limited opportunities for energy providers to access finance to serve the urban poor. In terms of policy, um, governments in Africa often avoid making any strategies to improve um, infrastructure or services in informal settlements for fear of it being perceived as legitimizing these areas. Um, and this is ob obviously um, mostly exacerbated by um, low security of tenure and is often seen as an operational risk by, private, by the private sector. Um, in, in addition to this, some of these informal settlements tend to be in prohibited and often dangerous areas. So as um, LBJ had actually mentioned earlier, um, some of these, uh, you know, some informal settlements may be located in areas such as um, close to the ocean or near riverbanks, railway re reserves, wetlands, 
And um, most of the time, it, it just makes it very challenging to provide sustainable infrastructure within the set standards of quality. Um, there's also, there also seems to be um, a predominant perception that people living in informal settlements can't afford the improved services offered by energy providers, yet there appears to be very little evidence to support this. Um, since informal settlements tend to be embedded in cities, data on informal settlements is often aggregated in overall within overall urban data. So usually the data that exists does not portray, um, portray a realistic scenario of energy access in informal settlements and sheds very little light on the low levels of access in these communities. And on the demand side, um, cost priorities and awareness are the key barriers to access. Um, it is not enough for end users to afford the energy assets, for example, LPG, cylinder or wiring. Um, they also need to be able to afford these energy sources on a regular basis, which means they need to be able, for example, to refill the LPG cylinder whenever it is empty or pay for the electricity consumed. With other competing needs such as access to food, clean water, healthcare, proper sanitation and education, it may over time become a challenge for them to keep up with the payments unless an intervention is put in place to improve affordability. In some cases, the decision may actually not even be um, on the end of the end uh, of the end user side. Landlords and property owners have at times made decisions on what tenants can, can and cannot use, which affects the decision on which technologies to prioritize over which. And finally, awareness and capacity to um, awareness of and capacity to use available improved um, energy technologies contributes to the rate of access and adoption of suitable solutions. Um, customers, for example, will tend to go for products or services that they know are already being used successfully in other parts of the informal settlement or in nearby areas. Policies, if, po if properly communicated and enforced by local governments and national governments, have the potential to greatly improve access in informal um, settlements. For example, um, policies around improving affordability, such as free, su or, subsidi um, free or subsidized connection strategies, um, subsidized LPG prices, uh, a lifeline electricity uh, tariffs. But the problem now is most households and microenterprises are actually not even aware these policies exist. Um, next, please. So given this background, then, how do we then implement energy access interventions to ensure impactful results and sustainability within um, informal settlement communities and in the urban space um, as a whole? Um, this will obviously require close collaboration and engagement with key stakeholders, both within the communities and, um, and government and private, uh, well, both within the communities and at government and private sector level. So who do we need? Um, I think um, we need the private sector to pioneer innovation um, that seeks to meet the needs of urban informal settlement communities, while also bringing about social impact. Um, a certain level of competition will help drive down technology costs, improve R&D in innovation, and improve customer services. The private sector could also support in developing robust um, systems and processes to capture key data that would help with understanding and profiling urban informal settlements for um, energy planning. We also need the public sector to create a conducive policy environment that allows for private sector involvement in improving urban energy access. Um, the private sector will also provide an oversight um, that is needed to ensure that the interventions are streamlined with national and local development strategies and that the needs of the communities are met. Um, the, and then Obviously, private and private um, public private sector uh, partnerships help to help um, to improve the confidence of financiers, for example, and investors in funding energy access interventions because of government or policy backing. Um, the local communities input is also very um, uh, crucial in helping to identify key gaps in energy access challenges to access and also in designing a suitable intervention, including what other additional support would be needed um, for the intervention to be successful. In addition, community buy-in ensures long-term um, 
adoption of improve, improved energy and subsequent social impact. It is also important to consider interventions that align with the community's own development plans and the role of improved energy access in realizing um, these plans. Um, development organizations, academia, and um, energy access alliances play an important role in facilitating partnerships between various stakeholders and building the relevant capacities to ensure that the partnerships are, are successful and useful. Um, they also help with supporting service developers, uh, service providers in developing robust and financially viable business models. They help with building and gathering lessons that will inform scale up and replication for of interventions. And to some extent, they will help. They would also help with mobilizing financing needed to uh, to implement to implement improved energy access pro programs. And then um, finally, we will also need uh, financiers and investors to not only provide the funding needed to implement energy access interventions, but to also help ensure that the financing is linked to achieving pos positive um, social impact. Financiers also uh, provide opportunities for innovation and action research to improve best practices in intervention, which in turn help to improve the products and services offered um, to the informal settlement communities. Next, please. Um, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, with all this in mind, and obviously being appreciative of the fact that there is no one size fits all. I mean, every informal settlement is unique in its own, in its own way. Um, so but even when it comes to providing or implementing interventions for uh, improved access, we also need to keep that in mind. But there are some commonalities in the factors to consider when designing a suitable intervention. We need to address um, questions such as, how, how much do the target communities know about improved ener energy access? How can we, uh, and how can these knowledge gaps be addressed? Um, can the end users pay for continuous use of uh, the improved technologies? How can we best determine their ability and willingness to pay for these um, solutions? Would the introduced um, solution compete with other spending priorities by end users? Is there infrastructure available to deliver the proposed intervention? And if none is present, or if the infrastructure present is not re robust enough, what additional efforts need to, um, are needed to improve it? And who would be best placed to make these improvements? Are the service providers um, technically and financially equipped to implement the intervention? And if not, what do they need? Who is best placed to, to build their capacity? Are there opportunities for both service providers and end users to leverage um, funding for energy access? Who within the local communities or the local governments and national governments should be part of the intervention? Um, I mean, I'll, uh, again, um, this has already been mentioned. It's like aligning with the right people um, to implement something on ground and what roles would they play in facilitating the success of the project? Are there any policy gaps um, that need to be addressed? And if any exist, how much effort would it take to address them and who would be placed to facilitate these changes? How does the intervention fit with the community's short to long-term development plans? How does the intervention affect other competing energy access activities, whether they're formal or informal? And how do we ensure that livelihoods are not displaced because of the intervention while also increasing opportunities for job creation. Does the intervention also consider gender balance um, in access and as well as marginalized groups? And are there other economic enablers such as productive use uh, of energy, for example, that could be paired with improved energy access to foster economic growth in the communities? Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. I mean, I wish I could allow you to speak on and on, but unfortunately, we have to allow some other um, presenters to also um, 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 the opportunity to also present their, their um, cases or their slides. Um, but before I go on, I think we would um, we've gotten to the interactive part. That is the Q and A session. Um, 
but if you have any questions, please feel free to post it up um, into the chat. Um, uh, the, I, I could see that's quite a feverish kind of interactions going on in the chat menu. Um, I will just read a few of the questions that have been posted. I don't know whether they are questions or comments, but again, I, I think I would read it out and, and ask any of the speakers so far to respond to um, the question um, that has been presented. Um, Just a moment, um, I think. Yes, so the question comes from Jimmy. Please forgive me if I pronounce your surname wrong, but the question is from Jimmy. Um, we don't have your designation or where you actually texted this question from, but I find it quite interesting. It's on energy access without looking at the bankability, bankable projects, which makes access to energy economically empowering should be core Otherwise, investment without profitability makes little sense today in today's world. What is the way forward? I think this is where the question actually comes in. Um, what is the way forward towards energy access in relation to socioeconomic bankability of transformative projects coming from the private sector? Um, any of the panelists so far, if you can um, respond, I'll be quite grateful. Uh, Mercy Rose, you can take over then. Yeah, um, I think, um, thank you very much for that question. And, and I think it's actually very relevant in uh, this day and age where we're not just looking at private companies um, to making profit, but also what their products or their services mean for the communities that they are serving. So there has been a lot of, uh, there has been a trend coming up over the last few years where financiers are also looking at social impact. Um, so it's linking the financing aspect of um, the funding that they're bringing, bringing, putting into a business and linking it to the impact that it has on the beneficiary communities. And they're starting to be very um, serious about metrics and um, monitoring and learning around the social impact that comes with the products and services. So this is something that's actually happening a lot uh, among investors. Um, there are obviously social impact investors. Um, the development finance um, institutions are also looking closely into um, the met uh, key measures of uh, social development. So this is actually it's it's actually a really good thing that's um, that's been coming up and um, and I hope that it continues to grow over the uh, over the coming years because it's a very good way to also measure impact in the long run. Um, I see. Um, any other speaker wanting to actually um, um, support Messi's comments or? Um, can make any additional contribution. So please feel free if you have a question. Um, I think the gentleman who I missed earlier on, um, Belinga, um, you have a question. I will enable you to be able to ask your question now. Um, yes, it's over to you, Belinga. Um, unfortunately, we don't. Uh, okay. okay, hello. Okay, hello. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, my is a francophone, no anglophone. My, my question is uh, uh, for uh, problems energy for women and Guinea. Because energy is very important for women in uh, West Africa. What solution is uh, give to women in uh, Africa for the energy access? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very, very important question. And it's one of the focal points in this particular INACT project. Um, I would wish any of the speakers could actually respond to that, um, more preferably Martin. Um, Martin, would you want to respond to that? Because I recall in your presentation, you indicated about energy sensitivity policy on energy access. And I, yeah, if you can actually give us a bit of how 
um, Uganda is actually addressing that gap and how you think other countries can actually learn from, from Uganda. Please go ahead. Uh, thank, th thank you, Akweku. Uh, the, the, the observation in, in Uganda has been that uh, uh, there's a need for uh, gender mainstreaming, uh, even in the energy sector. And uh, while we think about uh, making it policy in ways to support uh, women in the in, in the in, in, in the in the industry sector where we're talking about, uh, for example, uh, uh, having so supporting women as beneficiaries uh, for clean energy technologies or uh, uh, having them as uh, energy service providers. Uh, we also are cognizant that even in the home, in the household. Uh, we need to find a way to to to, to have uh, gender mainstreaming uh, uh, as a priority. We do realize that there's a problem. That there's a, there's a, a data gap where we have uh, we, we need to get more accurate data on uh, energy use in the household. For example, uh, the recent studies by the Uganda Bureau of Statistics was showing that uh, men take more time collecting uh, firewood. Uh, uh, for cooking, but uh, that is not enough data to put women at the forefront because we, we say that they are collecting more, but then uh, when it comes to the household, who is using more, who is using what, how do we uh, enable that? So this is one of the things that the Ministry of uh, Gender has been uh, uh, helping us to uh, assess, uh, to, to, to collect data on, and we believe that through uh, this disaggregated data, we can be able to uh, put even more uh, targeted policies towards uh, promoting uh, uh, pr promoting uh, the, the the gender mainstreaming uh, in our implementations. Thank you. Um, again, in terms of your submission on gender mainstreaming, it's quite coincidental that our next speaker is actually going to speak a little bit about gender and gender mainstreaming. Um, Dr. Karim from Makerere University um, would be actually be speaking on a similar topic. But before I go ahead, I would also want to remind um, those who are joining us again, um, who failed to actually join at the introductory session, um, that this is an enacting energy assess in Africa's urban um, informal settlements. Um, it's a webinar series that is part of the Enax project which stands for enabling um, Africa's, African cities for transformative energy access. Um, it's funded by the FCDO, um, managed by the Carbon Trust, um, implemented by ICLE in partnership with um, Energy for Impact, in, in, in partnership again with um, city, um, uh, the city of Freetown and, uh, and, and Kampala. Um, before I go ahead, um, Dr. Karu, please, uh, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Kweku, and thank you for those very kind introductory words. I kindly request that uh, you help me share screen my presentation so that, you know, it's uh, controlled from your side. So, uh, uh, good afternoon, colleagues, and nice to meet you all. I'll focus on the uh, interactions between energy and gender equality and in the context of Africa's uh, uh, urban settings and informal settlements for that matter. And I'll just uh, focus on two points of discussions in the next six minutes on why actually gender equality matters if Africa is to transition to sustainable energy in cities and also what are some of the entry points for engendering or mainstreaming gender in policies and partnerships uh, that can effectively respond to the needs of informal settlements in Africa and with examples from Uganda. Uh, the first point on why gender equality matters is that gender equality, sustainable energy and urbanization, as we have highly earlier hinted, uh, are not only global commitments uh, in terms of the SDGs and intersecting across the other SDGs on employment, on innovation, life underwater, and life on land, 
but also those three global commitments can bring about trade-offs and core benefits in SDG implementation. So the point of seeing them as global commitments is very, very important, but we also need to ask ourselves, what are the trade-offs and core benefits if uh, uh, we are to implement these three global uh, 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 commitments and in what context do those trade-offs and core benefits come to fruition on the ground to the benefit of informal settlements? And I think that is a question that uh, needs to be followed up through uh, after this webinar. The other point is that the agenda best differences <clears throat> in the needs and contributions that women as compared to men make. And of course, we need to look at women and men, not just as beneficiaries and vulnerable people in informal settlements who have limited access to the appropriate mix of energy sources, but also we have entrepreneurs in the energy and informal urban sector. As you can see on uh, 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 the right hand side of my presentation, you can see those youthful women who are using uh, off grid energy technologies to engage in wielding uh, uh, industry. You can see also on the left hand side, the picture below there are women who are engaged in uh, translating waste into energy through the use of uh, briquettes as an alternative cooking fuel. So, uh, but you can see that in most of our discussions on pri pro private sector engagements and uh, how we can innovatively finance energy access in Africa, we depict women as vulnerables, women as beneficiaries, rather than women and men as entrepreneurs in informal settlements who also need to be supported, who also have a voice and agency in ensuring that there is innovative financing for energy access in Africa. The emergence of COVID-19 definitely brings to bear uh, the energy related inequalities in Africa. And this, according to preliminary studies, are hitting women who are facing intersecting forms of discrimination, including market women, women in informal settlements, women of color, urban refugee women, women with disabilities, lone parents, and women in abusive intimate relationships. Meaning that therefore we need to have an intersectional approach to the understanding of gender equality and energy access. So women and men are, are not homo a homogeneous group, but rather the kinds of barriers, enablers and facilitators for energy access amongst women and men uh, are intersection in nature and not necessarily categorical alongside a, a, a homogeneous understanding of those two groups. Next slide, please. So what are some of the entry points from my point of view, if we are to mainstream gender in policies and partnerships that would then uh, address the unmet energy needs in informal urban settlements? Uh, first, the dialogues and partner dialogues around partnerships and policies need to uh, transcend the focus on vulnerability and on the entire focus on women as energy poor at household level. We also need to look at women as people who are capable and as transformative figures in communities. A recent study that was done by the International uh, Union for Conservation and Nature it showed that, for example, most of the country level documents on sustainable energy for all uh, within the UN were largely focusing on women as vulnerable groups, as beneficiaries uh, 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 of projects or as stakeholders in workshops. Little, almost two, only 2% two of those documents were really focusing on women as people who are agents of change in their communities, as energy entrepreneurs, as energy educators with capabilities to transform uh, their communities. So the dialogue is tilted towards vulnerability and therefore needs to be shifted towards women's capabilities and transformative capacity. It is also possible to uh, identify an appropriate mix of on-grid and off-grid services that can expand access. Most of the focus in the policy circles is on network expand, expansion, which then meets the national indicator in the national development plans, which is number of connections per grid. But we are seeing an emergence of off-grid energy services, which then allow 
uh, local communities and women in particular to make improvements in terms of energy access. And if the, for example, public private partnerships or even policy approaches can identify an appropriate mix of on grid and off grid services, then these can be co identified, co designed, and co implemented with women as entrepreneurs and beneficiaries in informal settlements. The other issues around orderliness and inclusivity. Most times, uh, government approaches access to energy from simply policy options that ensure orderliness, you know, grid lines and making sure that those who steal power are punished. But balancing orderliness with inclusivity is key, and we need to treat them as interdependent policy objectives, but also outcomes. And this is why the lack of balance between orderliness and inclusivity, this is why we are seeing a lot of power theft and illegal power tapping from electric poles in many of the African informal settlement cities. Uh, here in Kampala, we have uh, uh, the people we call the Kamiofu. In Nairobi, they call them the Mulikamwezi, who are navigating the landscape of uh, making sure that they provide grounds for inclusive connections, for inclusive provision of power due to the fact that the policies and the municipal interventions at play resonate with orderliness, but are devoid of norms and opportunities for guaranteeing inclusivity and access. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Karim, for that insightful um, um, presentation on, on inclusivity um, with regards to gender and gender mainstreaming. Um, it's, it's quite interesting that our subsequent or remaining speakers are all female, and I get they would actually throw more light on, on the gender inclusivity components of energy assets. Um, but before I go on, um, Shane, um, Bloom from CST um, did some work on energy access in, in Kanini and we present her slides. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. Today I would like to tell you about a story of a public private partnership in South Africa. So Inkanini is an informal settlement adjacent to the township of Kaimandi. It's about three kilometers from Stellenbosch town center in the Western Cape, South Africa. It has a population of over 8,000 inhabitants and constitutionally everyone in South Africa is subjected to basic needs like water and electricity supply by the government. But unfortunately, this is not the case for everyone. So you find that people are using illegal and informal and dangerous connections from the formal houses in Kaimandi to informal houses in Inkanini. And currently a connection like this could cost you up to 350 Rand per month. So kerosene is also used for lighting in the houses. It is highly flammable. And this together with makeshift electricity connections can cause serious shack fires that destroy lives and livelihoods. So the ISHAC project is a social enterprise established in 2012 to roll out solar home systems in the Inkanini informal settlement. And the project has developed a public-private partnership model for the delivery of affordable solar electricity. Currently, 1,800 households in Inkanini have access to 50 to 70 watt solar home systems that provides power for lighting, television, and cell phone charging. In 2017, another pilot was rolled out in Sequala, Philippi. In the particular local conditions and absence of City of Cape Town subsidy funding, launching the ISHAC project into a different financial model called Help to Buy. It's a program where ISHAC helps residents to buy their own solar home system, paying off the costs in affordable monthly installments over 24 months. And in 2018, in partnership with Shack Dwellers International, the South African Alliance and Community Organization Resource Center, the Longlands community became the third pilot project for ISHAC. Each household participates in a savings scheme 
where each household have received a grant loan contribution from the South African Alliance for the cost of their solar home system and television. And they pay back the loan portion via the savings group. In the meantime, ASHAC is involved in more projects in Greater Cape Town area, but an interesting part of the evolving business plan was when in 2015, Stellenbosch municipality restructured the free basic electricity policy on a local level to allow um, residents from Enkinini to participate formally in the ASHAC project by paying the monthly subsidy fee for each household that opted into the service and become the first non-grid system to enable energy users to access free basic electricity in the urban informal settlement. So ASHAC is also driven to create green jobs for the unemployed youth in local communities. And the project trains and employs residents from the community and installers and maintenance agents, establishing the meaningful livelihood in the green economy the unique knowledge and understanding of the community continues to improve the project system and policies. And basically, in conclusion, this corner German in Canini can provide a service to their local community at night or day because a social enterprise, ISHAC, is making use of a small scale off-grid distribution network by providing electricity to this community. And in partnership with a local municipality in Stellenbosch that restructured the free basic electricity subsidy policy, local communities can benefit from this. Thus, the ISHAC achieves the decarbonization and social justice goals of energy democracy yet is dependent on the availability of these free basic electricity subsidies, the commitment of the communities and participation. If you want to know more about the IASHAC project, you're welcome to look at their website, information on the slide. Uh, if you want to reach out to me regarding my research the last three years, you're welcome to email me. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Um, so this is a pre-recorded um, slide. Um, Shane is actually online to respond to any of your questions. Kindly post it in the chat. Um, she would gladly respond to them. Um, again, if you have any specific questions to also ask, you can ask them in, during the Q&A session. But because we're actually running out of time, I would also want to actually sign a, a, a bit of a caution here. I mean, if you want to leave, um, we might run a bit over time due to some few technical hitches here and there. Um, so please bear with us. Um, we have the last um, speaker, but I failed to also introduce the case study that is part of this particular uh, project. Um, it's a five case studies from five um, countries in, in the global south, Kenya, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and India. Um, it's actually uh, a report that is benchmarking energy access um, in informal settlements in the global south, looking at all the various um, uh, partnerships that are actually formed around um, energy access in, this, in these particular settlements. Um, if you want to read more about this particular report, um, the link is actually shared in the chat box. Um, please feel free. Um, to read it and, and, and if you want any additional information, again, you can email Ickley or email me directly um, because I put that particular document together with my team. Um, we have the last speaker. And as you all know, we reserve the last, the best for the last. Um, um, so we would go to Zimbabwe. Um, I think today we are, evolving around, moving around the entire continent. Um, dialogue on shelter for homeless, for the homeless in Zimbabwe. Um, trust, um, Mrs. Patience, please take over from me. Thank you, Kweku. And hello, everyone. Uh, my presentation, I'm going to concentrate on community-led interventions regarding solar provision 
in informal settlements in Zimbabwe. And I'm going to speak, um, I'm going to talk about the background to the project and the implementation approach that was used as well as the funding mechanisms to fund the project and uh, where we are now in terms of uh, scaling up and um, sustainability of the project. Uh, this project was implemented by the partnership of Dialogue on Shelter uh, Trust, which is a national non-governmental organization, and um, a partnership with community-based networks of informal uh, dwellers in Zimbabwe called the Zimbabwe Homeless People's Federation and Zimbabwe Young People's Federation, which is a network in 73 urban local centers in Zimbabwe. In this partnership, we are an affiliate of uh, Slum Dwellers International I think the previous speaker uh, talked about Slum Dwellers International having partnered their project in South Africa. So while it's this, uh, the process uh, of community-led energy provision was taking place in South Africa, Zimbabwe was also doing the same or a similar project. The pilot started in 2016 in an informal settlement that is at the periphery of uh, Harare, the capital city of Zimbabwe. And um, this informal settlement, like most informal settlements, had a number of uh, inadequacies, uh, not only in relation to energy, but also they were off grid uh, in terms of access to uh, water, there was no reticulated water, there was no reticulated uh, uh, sanitation system, and neither were they connected to the electricity grid. And this project was also implemented as part of a big uh, slum upgrading intervention of each of which energy uh, provision and improvement was seen as a key element to the slum upgrading um, uh, program. And before the project was started, um, sources of, uh, of lights in this informal settlement uh, were mainly candles and uh, paraffin lamps. And um, as we all know, uh, these, uh, the naked lights, there's a lot of uh, risks that are associated and um, there were several incidences of uh, sharks catching fire uh, because of uh, the, the, the open flames that were being used. The focus of the project was to provide a solar home systems to residents of this informal settlement as a pilot. Uh, where the community would lead the process. This was a community at that time with uh, 500 households. And um, these households were organized into saving groups. They'd been organized well before this intervention. And um, uh, there was uh, a, a data collection, community-led data collection exercise that was carried out by the savers themselves would provide capacity for them to do so. And it is during this process that they identified uh, the need for improved access to, 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 to safer energy sources for lights that uh, the, the need was identified. And um, subsequent to the identification of these community needs, uh, people then volunteered from their saving groups to be trained in various aspects of delivering these lights. 
so this included women uh, and men coming forward to be trained by uh, technical partners, technical colleges on the installation of uh, solar systems and um, also on maintenance and how to bring awareness to, to solar energy issues to communities. Some were trained on how to issue loans and to uh, track the repayment of these loans. Yet others were trained on mobilizing communities so that they could come together to access uh, this, uh, to be part of this project. And all these people who were trained, uh, they also managed to get um, stipends for the work that they were doing. And some of them are using their skills uh, in neighboring communities where they are being paid a fee for doing so. And can we go next to this? this slide. So this, um, the, how this project was funded, the, the groups of uh, women led saving groups, they had developed over the years a culture of saving and lending. And using this model, they would then uh, ensure that they have a deposit that they could uh, put towards accessing a loan. The loan was being provided by a, a, a fund that we call the Kungano National Urban Poor Fund. This is basically a community fund made up of community savings from the different uh, savers in the 73 have been sent us that I talked about. And in turn, it was supported by external funding from Slum Dwellers International to kick off the energy project. And even though it was a grant from Slum Dwellers International to Gungano Eben Poor Fund in Zimbabwe, there was an agreement that the grant would be turned into a loan facility that would revolve at the national level. So any loan repayments that were obtained from this fund would not go back to SDI, but would be used to fund similar projects in Zimbabwe. And this is what is taking place at the moment. Next, please. So it, we have managed to, to reach uh, 12, 12 cities and 22 settlements in, 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 in Eben, Zimbabwe through this intervention. We have reached 1,950 households through the uh, solar home systems, but we have also taken the project further from just to households to community interventions. We've, um, it has turned into uh, community interventions such as solar powered balls being installed in some of these settlements to increase access. And it has been very relevant, especially in this time of COVID in the sense that uh, it has enabled, uh, enabled us to bring piped water to the communities and, and that can be spaced in terms of the water points being spaced and being COVID compliant. We've also introduced uh, solar lights uh, to ensure that uh, there's uh, improved security and protection to the residents of any particular uh, community. And uh, the project is ongoing mainly because we have uh, uh, funded it as a revolving fund and we expect it to reach more settlements and to reach co more communities. So even though it started in 2016 and the external funded ended 18 months later, this is six, seven years and the project is still ongoing. 
So thank you very much for, for paying attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and there's a question in the in the comments that was actually asking for the KPIs um, to the KPIs um, required to actually implement an effective energy access project um, in Africa. And I think you touched on each one of them from financing, from community involvement, from partnership with government and other agencies, and how to sustain a project beyond the lifespan of of funding. Uh, or from donor funds. And then I, I think it's quite a, a, an interesting um, summary of all the various case studies and the various presentations that you've also mentioned. Because again, your presentation also touched on gender, uh, the gender dimensions and all that. So again, as I indicated earlier, I think um, all our remaining presenters are going to be female. Um, but before I actually, um, draw the presentations to a close. Um, there are a few, few questions in the chat that I think um, we can, we would have to address before we actually draw the curtains to a close on today's session. Um, I'm not sure whether this is actually a question or a comment um, from, from one of the viewers um, from Mr. Odoa. Sorry if I pronounce your name inaccurately, Mr. Odo, Odawa. I kindly, I, I kindly and humbly request that all presentations in this very rare and unique forum to be shared to all participants. Please guide and advise me, thanks. Um, so what would happen after this particular session is we would uh, post the webinar session, the questions, and you can follow through all the various um, presentation, there are papers and links to the various publications linked to all the presenters. You can take your time and digest the various materials that we have actually made available during this particular um, session. Uh, I could actually see a lot of interactions in the chat room. Uh, please feel free, post your questions in there. There's a lot of questions that I cannot respond to due to the limitations that we, with, with time. Um, however, please feel free, we have all our contact information and details in, shared within the various documents that have been distributed in the chat. Um, so kindly feel free to actually reach out to us if you need any additional information. Um, we don't want to keep people on the webinar for far longer than we planned. Um, so we would actually draw, uh, I, I would invite um, my project manager to actually uh, give us a closing remarks and I would, I would end the session after she presents. Thank you very much, Quick Crew, um, and everyone for, for joining us today. My name is Nachi Maje, as Quick mentioned, um, I'm the project manager for the INEC project. So what I will be doing um, is that I'm meant to, sorry, let me just hold on, but a bit of, okay, perfect, there we go, it, it's clear. So I'm not going to um, be spending much time um, on, on providing a full summary. And I'll just request that with the, with the Rise Africa that quick will, will go um, over that shortly. So uh, maybe we can just for now um, take that off screen. So um, thank you very much um, to everyone for joining the INACT project's first webinar on um, enacting energy access in Africa's urban informal settlements, which would not have been possible had it not been for our funder, the FCGO, as well as um, our project partners, um, the Carbon Trust, as well as um, Energy for Impact. And we really are grateful to the project partners, um, to the project cities rather, um, Kampala, Freetown, as well as the, the ministries from, from Sierra Leone, as well as Uganda. And uh, most importantly, the, to, to the participants and the speakers. And we're really happy to have seen such a diverse audience from across the, the, the globe and specifically on the continent with um, participants from Nairobi, Uganda, um, South Africa, Kenya, Zimbabwe, 
Ghana and Guinea. So the list is really is, is long. And this goes to show just how important this topic is um, of energy access, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. So with that said, I think we'd all agree that um, the content shared and, and discussed during the webinar was very valuable. Um, and it was also good to see the sharing of real life challenges um, to energy access. So not only in terms of, of the numbers or, or the stats, but through actual life experiences that were shared by Freetown, as well as um, the Uganda Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development. And also through the case studies um, that were shared, showing that it is possible to be able to, to use innovative um, and innovative financing models for the delivery of, of um, energy access. So that, that was particularly useful. And I'd just like to draw your attention again to the link that was shared on these five case studies. Um, today, we were able to um, share two of them. So I, I very much encourage you to read the, the rest of those case studies. It's a, it's, it's a useful document. And then um, just as I draw to an end on the closing of the webinar, um, as I mentioned, I'll not be recapping on, on the challenges, the barriers, and the good practice that were presented today. But I just want to highlight um, what the INEX project will be doing over the next two years. And this is very much in response to the, the challenges and barriers that were shared today, but that I think everyone on this call is aware of. And the INEX project will then ensure that we support um, the public sector to be able to create an enabling environment for energy access. And this can, amongst other things, be done through the improvement of the policy environment and really enhancing the vertical integration between the local as well as the national level. I think there's something that, that came up about the issues of mandates and devolution. And in the absence of the devolution, what can then be done? And this really does require very close working relationship between the national as well as the local level. And then another aspect is that the public sector cannot do this alone. So the importance of private sector came on very strongly. And this is also a focus area of the INEX project. So we will be working with the private sector in the two project cities to implement clean cooking um, solutions as well as lighting solutions. And in doing so, we will be prioritizing on the aspect of gender. And this is something that was spoken about um, today. So through the INEX project, we'll be focusing very much on, for example, working with, um, with women owned um, businesses or private sector that can then be providing these solutions on the ground. And even with the uptake of the clean cooking and lighting solutions would really much want that to be centered around, around women. And um, in terms of financing and business models, this came up quite a lot in the chats as well. So through the INEC project, we will be um, looking at innovative financing models of how um, households as well as micro enterprises can be able to, to um, have access to these clean cooking as well as lighting solutions that are affordable. So that is going to be a big component of, of, of the project. So um, lastly, to mention that we will be undertaking a number of capacity building and training for the public sector um, in our project um, cities. And we'll be doing this in collaboration with the respective ministries of, industry, of, of, of energy. And please look out for a call for proposals um, and request to respond to a terms of reference for the implementation of the clean cooking and lighting solutions in Freetown and, and Kampala so that we can find the best service providers to, to be able to, to do this um, work on the ground. And we'll be running continuous communication and awareness raising campaigns throughout the project. And this has already started. So I'd like to invite you to please um, follow um, Italy Africa uh, um, on Twitter, and the the our handle will be shared in the in the link and in, in the in the chat box. So it's at Italy Africa, and we also have a running hashtag hashtag in Act Energy as well as hashtag Transforming Energy Access. So if you want to be updated on all the project activities, please follow us on Twitter as well as um, through the the Italy website. So with that said, thank you very much for your active participation. Um, the questions, comments, um, requests for collaborations have all been noted and we'll be um, following up on those and we'll look forward to being in touch with you again very soon. And I'll now hand back to Peku to close the webinar for us. Thank you. Thank you, um, Nachi. Um, thanks for the very apt pre presentation and overview 
of the next stage in terms of what the INAC project is going to do. Um, before I actually draw the curtains to a close, I just want us to do a few basic tasks. Kindly turn on your cameras. Please, no microphone, just your cameras. Um, everyone, please, speakers, participants, kindly turn on your cameras. Uh, in a live situation, uh, we would have actually be taking a, a group photograph, but unfortunately, um, we have to be innovative with regards to how to go about this. Turn off uh, on your cameras and um, and we'll take a screenshot. But before I actually leave you with, um, my name is Kweku Kranton. Again, I'm a professional officer for ACLE Africa. Um, um, and I would want to draw the curtains to a close. I'm very grateful for the time that you you made to actually uh, present your various pieces, the time for listening and the time for actually um, um, sharing your questions and your contributions and your discussion. It has been an amazing time um, and I look forward to our future interactions in the near future. And bye. <laughs>